Welcome back to another episode of Squawk 876. I'll be your host for this week. My name is Richard Gordon, and I have here with me today a very special guest coming all the way from JFK Operations. Uh, it's a great aviation professional. I like to think of her as a, a powerhouse of a woman based on all of the, her accomplishments and all that she's happened to do over the, the time span that she's been in aviation. So. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to, to introduce Renee. So, hi. Hi, Renee. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. It's a little bit hot, but it's good. It's a little bit hot. Yeah. Renee, Renee is coming straight from the airport directly to ACWI, and she's graciously agreed yes. to do this interview with us. Right? So, uh, like I said, thank you. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Right. Really so I, I just want to get uh, right into to what we're, we're doing today. Okay. Uh, as you know, Squawk 876 is, is, a, is a show that, that we've conceptualized and uh, basically what we're trying to do is get aviators, especially Jamaican aviators, mm -hmm. bring them to the fore and tell their story, put their story out to the, the public, right? Gotcha. So what I, I, I want to get into now is your your upbringing how, okay. how you grew up as a, a child here in jamaica because you, you don't live in jamaica now no you? i don't live in jamaica anymore but i um, migrated when i was 17 so i did spend my primary school and high school life here you spent your, your primary school and yeah high school primary life school and high school um well actually i went to prep school first and i transitioned to primary school i went to st richard's after that um i graduated and i went to Wilmers. Mm -hmm. So I did the entire years at Wilma's up to Fifth Farm. I didn't go to Sixth Farm. Shortly after that, I migrated. However, um, while at Wilma's, um, I started doing CXC early. I think that's one of the big factors that really got my ball rolling. Is I always knew I wanted to be a pilot. That's number one. And I live under the straight in approach um, for one two, runway one two at Norman Manley. So I always oh, saw nice. planes. Always wanted to do it. You know. As much research as I could back then, I would. Um, actually, my neighbor, my neighbor um, father was a pilot, so they had a two-way radio. So we'd sit and we'd listen to um, manly, um, manly radio transmissions and stuff like that. But while I was at Wilmers, I started doing CXCs in second form. Right. Um, I did maths in second form for the first time, and I got a two. And my mom was like, no, you're going back, you're going to get a one. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a one in third form. At the same time, I did like English language and English literature. So by the time I graduated Wilmers, I had, five, I had nine ones. Um, nice. And that's just, you know, my parents putting in and investing into my career. I did a lot of Saturday and Sunday classes where I had mm -hmm. to travel up to Campion College or I had to go to Spanish Town for this teacher or wherever. Right. Wherever the class was, I did that. Um, but yeah, that was, you know, my, my background coming into it. Right. I looked at classes like physics and chemistry and mathematics your, and your geo. Favorite, favorite yeah, these were the school. classes that I knew if I had taken them, they would have given me a bigger chance or a bigger step into aviation because you, you need to know geography, right. right? You need to know, um, maths and physics and chemistry and stuff like that. So I was on a science based track and thereafter I went to the States and, the States. um, Going to the States, I actually went back to high school. And when I went back to high school, they have a dual trading program. So you do half day regular high school and then you do half day aviation high school. All right, hold on. So, so let's mm -hmm. backtrack a bit, right? You said uh, your, your, neighbor, your neighbor's dad was yeah. a pilot. So you said they had a two-way radio and all of that. So would you say that that is what sparked your interest in aviation? Tell us a little bit about it. Um, no, actually, it, it, was, it was just a fuel. It was like one of the catalysts to make me know that there was more to it than just seeing a plane fly ahead. Because as a two-year-old, three-year-old girl, you know, I used to just sit on my roof and just watch the planes come in. You don't know the plane type, you don't know what they're doing, but you just know the plane them got foreign, right? right. You know, so <laughs> them I come back from foreign and right. you don't know the systems behind it and none of that. So my friend's dad had, you know, a whole aviation room where he had model planes and maps and his two-way radio that he would plug in and listen. So um, for that, that was like, you know, something that kept me going as a kid, you know, growing up. Right. So, so, so you said you went to aviation high school in in the states. Yeah. 
that's something that I personally didn't <laughs> know. I never knew something like that existed. So what was that experience like? Um, go, first of all, how did you find about the, the possibility of going to an aviation high school? Um, believe it or not, I come from an aviation family. Um, I have about eight family members in this industry, and um, we vary from pilots to airport inspectors to um, airline, in, airline managers. So my aunt actually went to the school before I did. She actually went to Wilma's as well. She migrated before me, my mom's baby sister. So she went to that school, and then she went to an aviation college where right. she also has an aviation degree. So she, when she went there she, and I came, I migrated. She was like, you have to go to this school. Um, so I went to the school and it was good. It was like you meet an app geeks, people like yourself who are young like you and enthused and right. you know, our flight was paid for and all of that stuff. So we had sim time. We had days where we went to the airport, Farmingdale, um, Farmingdale executive. Right. And we flew the 172s and you did your cross countries and you did your solo and you know you move on from there everybody either went to high school and it was one of the schools that they recruited from from college so you got college credit for your classes and all of that stuff right. so it was good it was you met like-minded people and right. my teacher was a former FedEx pilot for the former 76 pilot so you know he has real world experience and you really start to get more and more into the industry and just love it all over again Nice. So that brings me to the point that you mm -hmm. actually are a, a private pilot. Yes. Right. And you got your, your private pilot certificate at Aviation High School. Yes, in Aviation High School. Mm -hmm. High School. Okay. So you're a private pilot, but you decided that you wanted to go off and start your, your degree. Yeah. So what made you want to not go the full way with, with your pilot certification, but di divert and get a, a degree as well okay so when i went to college um before going into college i did what they call ap advanced placement courses because i already had physics and chemistry here when i went to the states i already finished out high school i was basically just as not wasn't at the age yet because america is one year lower than us so going back to high school they have what they call regents you have to take regents it's like a cxc exam um you have to take those and get a grade of one to go on to the next regents so my first three months, I studied for the regents, took the regents, got those. Then they're like, well, what do we do with her? We, she tapped out of everything. She just needs the age to go on to, to college. And my mom didn't want me to go on as a international student because if I came straight from Jamaica, being a US citizen, a permanent resident, and going into college, I would still be considered international. Why? Because I don't have a transcript from any high school mm -hmm. to say that I attended high school there. So I did the AP classes. Um, got i believe it's a one in ap and from there those ap classes counted towards college so the next su succession from that was like recruiting all these schools came to the aviation high school and they were like come to my college come here so you know right. we got offers from riddle we got offers from florida tech vaughn farmingdale at the time dolan was still up so we got offers from everywhere so it was like it's either you go to a flight school finish up your flight portion or go to an aviation school and get right. a degree with flight. So I decided to do that because I needed to have as many options as possible. Right. Whereas if I didn't want to fly anymore, which that turns out to be the case, is that not that I don't enjoy flying or right. I won't go back to doing it, but having the options to move around and pivot, like I do now, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible without a college degree. Nice, okay, yeah. great. And this is exactly why, why I described you as a, a powerhouse yeah. of, oh, of a woman. Thank you. Because <laughs> I, I get to understand that you have multiple degrees. Yes. Right. So what are your, your, your majors in? Okay. So I have a major in aviation meteorology, which is basically fusing aviation with meteorology, with the weather portion of it, um, computational mathematics and air traffic control as an undergrad. And then I have a master's in aviation safety. So it's looking at the safety management side of airports building manuals, moving towards a safer aviation overall. But that degree has so many facets inside of it. It has um, airport, airport inspections, it has FAA laws, compliance, ISO. Um, it also has uh, a component that you can create manuals. So having all of that under one degree was like, you know, gold, because that's where the industry is going. Okay, I understand. Yeah. All right. So we, we, so we had a, a discussion mm -hmm. pre 
prior to us doing this interview today. Yeah. One thing I got to understand from, from speaking with you previously is that a lot of persons don't know that if you do a degree with, with flight, mm -hmm. then if you don't complete the flight portion, then you won't be awarded a degree. Yeah. So without throwing anybody under the bus, would you be able to, to tell us um, a little bit more? About yeah, definitely. I think this is one of like the loopholes um, in college that no one speaks about. Um, when you go to an aviation-based school to have flight printed on your degree, so let's say you did aviation meteorology, to say you did aviation meteorology with flight, and you do not complete your flight portion due to any amount of you know factors, whether it is monetary, you you just you fear of flying, whatever it is that you know interferes with you completing that degree, that that flight portion, you will not be awarded your degree until you do so. So I think anyone going into the U.S.-based system to fly or to get a license should know that if you don't take flight off your degree before your second year, before the end of your sophomore year, your second year in college, then you'll be stuck with that forever and they will not mm. award you a degree. So basically right. it's, yes, I finished all of my coursework, but you cannot get a degree that is printed with flight until right. you get that, that, those licenses that they need, you know, for, to fulfill the requirements right. of right. That. that. So That definitely is something that all young people, especially here in Jamaica, because yes. a lot of persons, they, they don't have it. In the, in the monetary sense, yeah. right? the parents aren't rich, they don't have the, the money like that. A lot of persons, they make great sacrifices to mm -hmm. leave Jamaica, leave their family and friends, go to the States, yep. and they, they try to so pursue true. a career, but they, they don't know that before they get there. And then Yeah, it's a, it's a lot. I think it's a, if you're really dedicated to this industry and you really want to fly, um, you know, there's so many avenues of going about it. And if pilot is what you want to do, you just want to fly. You don't care that much about having options to do anything else. You know, going to a flight school might be a better option for you because you'd save on, you know, the 40000 or 50000 you'd pay every semester. Or even looking at a state college versus a private college because those are things that people don't talk about either. You know, the cost per credit is drastic. There's a drastic difference in, in what a public school charges versus a private school so those are things that I think anyone going into this industry which I wish I knew back then because um, I was offered scholarships to every school that I applied to um, but I said me I want to be in the weather I want to be warm I don't want to fly again in the cold you know right. so I went down to Florida but you know you have to find what is good for you and what is what is feasible Right, because you want to sustain yourself as well as you know, go to college and fly. But right. you know, what you guys are doing is tremendous. I believe this is an opportunity for anyone to seize. And if this was around when I was like, you right. know, younger in high school, of course, it would have yeah. been like the number one choice. Right. That's that's what what we're doing is the the aeronautical club mm -hmm. of the of the West. Yeah. Area, right. So uh, that that's just a a, a point to note for for any oh, other of person course, who, who of don't course. know about us and what we're doing mm -hmm. um, and we're really appreciative that, that you oh, decided to anytime. come down and <laughs> speak with us you know so anytime uh, I heard you say you wanted to be in the warm right mm -hmm. so it, the, was it was it the case that you had some some form of did you have a profession here in Jamaica that was aviation related yes I do I actually worked in Jamaica for about six years six before years. returning to the state so well, I what did you do um, Whew, that's a long one. Um, I started out as an aviation meteorologist, to be honest. Um, I got an intern. My first internship was here. I applied to a lot of different airports in the States. No one, you know, picked up on it. But mm -hmm. I got a reference to work at the Met Office at Norman Manley. Right. Um, and there my internship turned into me being a senior meteorologist, um, where I worked for about a year and a half. And then I moved over to civil aviation at Winchester Road. Okay. So... First, when I moved over there, I worked in obstacle avoidance because they needed help with their manuals. And that's where my um, master's came into play, came in, right. is that I was doing my master's online and I was working there at the same time. So I was there writing manuals, updating manuals, updating laws um, for obstacle avoidance and ATC. And then I moved over into the security and the safety department where I worked on um, the American Airlines accident, right. 331. I was the, um, what they call a subject matter expert 
in meteorology so I did the weather forecasting the weather analysis sorry the ATC analysis and basically the gap analysis which is looking at the laws seeing where we made a mistake or where the mistake happened in the whole accident occurrence and finding probable causes to determine you know to just basically create a straight line we should have did this in order to avoid this you know finding those links right. what they call chain of causation right. finding those chains that could have avoided that accident you know what could have been done on the airport side what could have been done atc what could have been done with crew resource management you know just overall looking at everything and finding out where the probable causes were Right. that way we could avoid that so that was actually one of my highlights um because right. i was 22 when i was doing that right. and i was the youngest person uh, in the room again, pull up pull up <laughs> that was like <laughs> what you guys want me to be on this team so i was uh, extremely grateful extremely grateful for everyone at CAA for giving me you know those opportunities to you know expand more and from there you know i worked a little bit with Casos which is basically the Caribbean portion of civil aviation. Mm -hmm. So I got the opportunity to work with the other small English speaking airports in the Caribbean with their manuals and right, stuff like right. that. So okay. that was big. All right. So that, that's your, your, your local mm -hmm. uh, experience with, with aviation. So, so then you had to transition back to the US, right? Yes. And you, you got your start in a very humble way. I did. It right. humbled me a lot. Right. So, a so lot. tell us, tell us what that that humble way was, and just just go um, further. So, coming from working in an office, right, um, to basically applying to tons of different jobs, and this is something that I speak about all the time. Is I applied everywhere, from weather, from meteorology, to being on TV, broadcast meteorology, to working for the FAA. I, I applied literally everywhere. I was sending in my application to a lot of places. Um, however, nothing was coming back, right? And it was like three months now I'm sitting home like, oh my gosh, but come back up and what's going on? <laughs> so I started to apply to the companies that were basically third party companies. So I applied to a cleaning company that actually cleans the bathrooms for JetBlue as a supervisor. Cause I'm like, this is one thing I think people don't know. Uncle Sam does not care what kind of job you do as long as you pay your bills on time. So. I got the job as a supervisor, I called mommy and I was like, mommy, I got the job as a supervisor cleaning planes. I don't care, I'm going to take it because it's, it's one step further, right. you know, and it was money in my pocket. So I was a supervisor coordinating JetBlue's ramp, what aircraft, you know, personnel should go to, to clean aircraft. And if I had to go on there and scrub a toilet, I scrubbed the toilet. Right. Why? Because the overall thing that people don't know is your stock prices for your airline is based on whether or not you get that flight out on time. So if it meant I had to go on there and scrub a toilet or clean up, you know, clean an aisle with, with a vacuum, I had to do it. Right. So um, from there, I worked there for like two months and then JetBlue actually called me. So I applied for several things inside of JetBlue, um, whereas I applied for um, at the headquarters to do a diff couple different jobs, didn't get through there. Then they call me for ground ups. What ground ups is, is basically packing the, packing the bags of the planes. <laughs> um, and that in itself was truly a humbling experience because going, knowing that I had all this flight experience and license and degrees and you know, you, you, ha you have a good job and to come back and packing bags on a, on a, on a, on a 190, right. a E190 or a, two, or a 320, right. you know, physically doing work, you know, that, that in itself was humbling. So right. I knew getting in, moving up was like the choice, was, was the, the route that I wanted to take. So okay. shortly thereafter, so I did that, move up. Um, coming in and, and being quote unquote humbled was actually a, 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 strategy, a strategy you'd say. Yeah was was you able to get in get your mm -hmm. foot through the door you have to do that you have to do that because the thing is what people don't understand as well is the there is no correlation between our system directly the, the ikeo system and what the faa has that right. they're offering so there's no major correlation to say okay i did airport inspections at Norman Manley. it is airport inspections at, at john f kennedy right there's, there's no, no correlation right. to that so um that was one of the things I had to do. I had to kind of dumb down my resume, whereas I would leave off my master's degree off there and I would leave off some of my experience. So right, it's, it's not, it's not like, it's, it's kind of like concealing, but you're playing, you're playing the roles that they want you to play. So it's not, 
okay, I'm this and I'm that and I'm this and I'm that, and I can basically run your company. You know, you're not going in with that attitude. You're going with an attitude that's, hey, I'm here, I'm willing to learn, and this is what you, you know, you'll benefit from having me as a part of, right. you know, your organization. So that's really what it is um, that people have to do in the States, especially since there's no direct correlation between what, you know, what we do here in the Caribbean versus what the FAA does. Right. So then that brings us to the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. 2020, the, the worst year of all time, or whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. uh, how has the, the pandemic firstly affected your, your field, the, the, the job that you do at JFK? Wow, it was like, um, you know, like a drop of ripe breadfruit. It was yes. like, every, it's like one day, February, we're good. March, it was like, they're like, we're doing this global shutdown and you just start seeing airlines pulling out, pulling out, pulling out, pulling out and not coming back. And that was like a awakening experience because you saw a busy airport that had over 2,500 flights a day go down to 200, if that. Then you start seeing your airlines that have long-term leases with the terminals start flying their planes to the desert to keep them, co to keep them warm. Right. So you start seeing this come down to this, where you start to really understand um, why we do what we do and how effective we are and, and how the U.S. market actually basically influences the entire world, you know, because an aircraft that comes from, let's say, Nairobi, right, Kenyan Airways, mm -hmm. is not coming anymore, right? You, you, the, the, Alitalia's, the, the big airlines that fly, the 7.4's and the 7.6's, you kind of see that those airlines aren't coming anymore. Then you start to hear about shutdowns, right? People not having the jobs. So how did you have to uh, adapt personally in, in your role at, at the airport? Oh, well, um, I, I don't say this to be boastful, but not much has changed for me. Mm, right. Um, I mean, that's good. That, I mean, it, that's it's, great. Trust me, I'm very, very grateful. Um, I have not lost a day of work or a day of pay, which I've seen that across the industry. Um, what we have done is we have unions. So our unions basically um, have a no layoff clause where they can't just get up and say, oh, we're not making money, so you can't make any money either. So we're just going to go down staff. Right. Um, we're built into what they call the ACM or the um, airport certification manual, which determines the number of people you need to perf perform a, a certain job to keep the airport open. So having Kennedy being over 5,000 square feet, if you have a snow event, you need almost 300 people to keep that airport up and running. Right. So because of that, no, they have to keep that number of staff on record. Right. Because if there's a global shutdown at Kennedy, you know, that it's, it ripples, that yeah, the ripples, the is, it's crazy. It's crazy how the ripples spread fast. And Kennedy, well, even though the 380 is not flying now, Kennedy was the only airport in the northeast section that could take the 380. So, you know, that would be bad if we had 500 people stuck in the sky and nowhere to land. So yeah, definitely not a good time. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I want to get into a, a fun question I had planned for mm -hmm. you, right? So looking back at... Your, your upbringing, your, all of the things that you've achieved, where you're at now. If, you could, if Renee could go back in time and give one piece of advice to her younger self, oh. what would that piece of advice be? Ah, that piece of advice would be summer of 2000, I should have worked at the beach and mm. probably flown half time. Instead of flying half time and never working at the beach. The reason I say that is, um, my pension would have started then because every right. national park or beach is considered under New York State pension. So I would have had less years I would have to work until I get to retirement. But, <laughs> right. you know, not knowing the knowledge of, you know, retirement. I wasn't, at that time, I wasn't really thinking about, you know, 30 years from now. Yeah, yeah, it was just, you need to fly, you need to fly, you need to get into a good college. And I really wasn't thinking about, you know, making sure that, you know, I'm set for life. So I wasn't thinking about it at that time, but that is something I would definitely go back and rectify because of the fact that, you know, I would have had a pension that started when I was 17 right. instead of, you know, 30 something, so. Right, okay, all right. The, that's, a, that's a fair one, very, it's a very mature oh, yeah. thing no, to, looking back, of course. to know. Right, <laughs> exactly. All right, so 
that that then takes me to the fact that a lot of young persons, myself mm -hmm. included, uh, we we just we're tunnel vision. We just we want to want to become a pilot, and that's the only thing I want to do with my life. That's all I care about. Yeah. I just need to fly. I'm not paying attention to the bigger picture. So, what advice would you have for younger folks coming into this industry who just have that tunnel vision? I just want to be a pilot. I'm going to fly, and that's the end of the story. What piece of advice do you um, have for those people? Whether you go above wing or below wing, or you go into airports, aviation is an industry. Right? It's an industry and you have to be able to pivot. Because if we look at, if we do a timeline of what has happened with the pandemic, who were some of the first people to lose their jobs? Okay, Unfortunately, it were the pilots. Right. Like the pilots were some of the first people to, you know, don't have an aircraft to fly, they don't have a route to fly, they don't have an airline to go back to because the airline went belly up. So you have to think what is sustainable for you. And if they, there's always a saying, if you're a good pilot, you're going to lose three or four jobs before your retirement. Because airlines go up, airlines go down. It really only takes like one or two accidents to actually right. make an airline become taxi turvy. But if you look on the grand scheme of things, an airline cannot just not land on an airport. An airport is not ran by itself, right? You have inspectors, you have mechanics, you have maintenance personnel, you have air traffic control. There's so many handles that you can you know, utilize and, and find a way of getting in. And that's why I say a degree program is so important, is that you always have it. You know, you always have your degree. If I want to go into air traffic control, now I can. You know, I always have my degree. I always, you know, have the results from my tests and stuff lose. like that. Yeah, you can't lose it. So always make sure that you can move around, you know, because if push come to shove and something happens with my job, I can go and be a meteorologist on TV, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So, you know, you, you just need to have your ducks in a row and really think long term. Because if you're just thinking, oh, I want to be a pilot and that's just a short term goal, you know, also look at the job market right now. You know, if you want to be a pilot and there's no jobs that's hiring, what are you going to do? So you have thing? a license and, you know, you can't fly nothing. Right. So, you know, definitely have the room to grow as well. You're always learning. So, you know, don't just be, don't just have that tunnel vision. Make sure that you always have a backup plan. All right. Okay. That, that's, that's a fair one as well. All okay. right. So, there's the last question I have for you. No right? problem. Go ahead. So, in Jamaica, the, the, the thing is, or the thing to say is, boy, aviation is dead in Jamaica. Uh, general aviation, it, it doesn't exist. Uh, personally, I find that after you've done your, your private license, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a huge gap between private and commercial actually flying as a job in yeah. Jamaica. Uh, in your professional experience, uh, I don't know if you've been looking at the, the local market or the mm -hmm. local industry, what, what what can you what have you noticed that is wrong fundamentally not right with the, the the local industry and how can we make the industry better okay how can we get it to pick up um i do believe in a forecasting like a funneling thing you have all these pilots but the dream job is to get get a job right and we see a, a ton of outsourcing because there's no jobs here right there's no national commercial airline that anyone can fly with. Right. So they go to other islands to, to see that or they go to the States or, or worldwide to, to get a job. There has to be a redevelopment of a national airline. That's number one. It doesn't have to be named Air Jamaica and it doesn't have to have the problems or the flaws that Air Jamaica had. Right, right, right. But there has to be a system whereas you have these talents and you have these personnel that want to get into this industry, developed and into the industry. Right. Um, we need more. I know as a fact that we need more people to fix antennas, VORs, DMEs, all of that stuff that we have here on the right, island. There's right. not enough qualified technicians. And once as you have that retirement age coming up, you're going to have that big gap between who's able to work and who's retiring. And then you're going to have a whole generation of people who don't have the background, they don't have the academic knowledge to actually go on and say, hey, I'm going to you know, indulge in this and do this as a career. So that's one of the things that I think Jamaica has to do is have a funneling program, whereas whether it is they buy one, 152s or 172s, <laughs> something right. small, right. and have people commute from you know, Mobe to here and you know, just develop the markets in so many ways. They have to become resourceful and creative at the same time because there's no way you can sustain 
an airline if you don't have the pilots one and if you don't have the market two. So the airline is smacked in between having enough staff to run it and having the industries that need it. That need it, right. So, you know, that's, that's that funnel that they need to create within the Jamaican market because there's tons of talented people all around the world who would love to come back. You know, they're in countries that they, they don't feel appreciated in and they would love to come back and work but there's no, in the, there's no market. There's no market right. for them to you know, come back and use their talent. So that's one of the things. It's just really that, that, that road from, yes, I have my degree. I went to school. I have my degree. So this is what I do with it. You know, this is where I work. Exactly. This is how I make my money. This is how I feed my family. And that's the most important part. You, know, you can spend 100000 200000 forget a license. But then if you can't feed yourself, what is, no, what the, is the value? Yeah, yeah, what is the value of that? So. You know, that's, that's all I have to say about it. I won't get too <laughs> won't, deep, won't but it's, too it's a lot of politics. And, right, exactly. Um, but it's not dead. It's not dead. It just needs a revival, I guess you can say. Right. Um, like many other systems in Jamaica, it just really needs good footing. And then basically constant development. It's not a me or you. And that's the reason I love that this is the club of the West Indies. Because it's not a Jamaican club. Right. It is a club for the West Indies. It's a club for kids to come from any other island. You know, you cannot afford to, to go to the States. This is something in CARICOM that you can come here, practice here, learn here, you know, and go on and service the entire Caribbean. So, you know, Good. that's just, that's just my two, two, two senses you, on it. I'm happy, you, I'm happy you said the words, it is not dead. No, it's not dead. Because it's honestly, dead. That, that's my personal opinion mm -hmm. as well. It, it's not dead. So, I mean, for me, what we're, what we're trying to do here is, is play our part because it's not a, if one person goes knocking on a door that the person on the other side doesn't want to open the door, then yeah. what can one person do? But if we come together as a collective and mm -hmm. we go and we, we kick the door down. Yeah. Then, I mean, <laughs> and sometimes you don't even have to kick the door down. I've learned, you know, if, if, if there's going to be a seat at the table or if the table is full and there's no seats, if they want you at the table, they'll pull up a chair. Right. Right? They'll pull up a chair or they'll make an extension to the table. And I found that out so many times over in life. You know, you apply to one job, you don't get it, and you get a lower position, and then they keep calling you to meetings. Like, come here, come here, give us your expertise. And you're like, all right, here's my bargaining agreement, you know? Yeah. Um, and sometimes the road, the road less trod is the road that actually works out. I call myself a bulldozer. If a road is not working, trust me, I'll pave another road for myself. <laughs> that dirt patch over there, give me. I'm going to pave a road for myself. And that's basically what you have to do in any industry. You know, in any part of your life, right. you, you really have to become, you know, your own, um, trailblazer. yeah, your own trailblazer in a sense, because tons of people, when I show up to interviews, they're like, oh, you know, <laughs> just by the look on my face, they're like, okay, right. I expected a male, number yeah, one, okay. when I walk in, because my name is Renee. So mm -hmm. you walk into many interviews and it's like, I expected a male, and then you start talking and they're like, Yes. I like her. I like her. So, you know, yes. um, you just really have to, to, to know who you are as a person. And as, as this club develops, you know, you guys are going to grow strength to strength. I see that. Um, you know, it is something that is needed in the Caribbean. And obviously, we need that market. We need that funnel after all these kids are, you know, qualified to be able to go out and work and earn, earn a living. You do what you love. And that's, what, that's one of the things I'm so grateful for every day is I do what I love right, and exactly. I make a living out of it. So. Okay, great. So, I mean, that, that's, that's what we have uh, that's what we have going on right now. I, I must thank you for all of the, the great words that you, no you've problem. said about us. Uh, we, we really do try to, to put our two cents in and try to steer the, this whole industry where mm -hmm. we would love to see it go and where we, we want it to go. Of so, course, yeah. Anything that I can do to help um, now or in the future, you know, I'm always willing to help. I think the future right. of aviation is here. Um, it's present and we are going into it. So we're growing. So it's present continuous. So it, it's not dead at all. And mm -hmm. trust me, mm -hmm. more love, more respect. This is just such an immense op opportunity for the students coming in, you know, to just definitely seize and, and be able to, even if them get a one hour, you know, you don't exactly. know what a one hour right. does for someone. Right. So, right. you know, that's, that's, that's where it is. Right. But thank you so much for the opportunity right. and I really appreciate it. <laughs> All right, so Rene, I really must thank you for leaving all the way from New York just to come oh, and visit us. No, no, man, trust me, don't worry Especially about that. Especially coming to, to visit don't us. Don't worry about that. Three hours reason. is nothing. Three <laughs> hours is nothing, right. anytime. Right, we are the reason why you are here today. Yes, so, yes. So, uh, 
Right. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap our show now. Absolutely. Uh, like I said before, thank you for coming down. Yeah, man. Anytime. Uh, and let me know if you want any of my friends to come and help we out as well. Love to have your friends. I would down. market and network for the club. And, and we must thank you as well for your donation of books. Most oh, in, absolutely. Most importantly, uh, the, you you'll see it on Instagram. But <laughs> What Rene has brought for us, and I'm sure you'll, you'll be more to come, us. more to come, no problem, more to come, right? So, uh, this has been another episode of Squawk 876. Uh, it's, a, it's an interview program that uh, the Aeronautica Club of the West Indies uh, it's, it's what we do. We, we try to bring aviators from where they are in the world, as you can see here with, <laughs> with the lovely Miss Rene, and we, we, we bring them and we, we give them to you put it out on the table, we talk about what their experiences are and how, how best you can, let's say you want to be an a operations person at JFK, how you'd be able to chart that, that, that route for yourself. So, Renee, thank you for coming. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Bye.